You see, Jerusalem and Israel were supposed to be kings and priests to God. They were supposed to be a testimony to the nations. They never were. In Daniel 9, you needn't turn to it, in verse 26 there's desolation, and in verse 27 there's the desolator. In verse 26 the desolation is to do with Jerusalem and Israel. In verse 27 the desolator is to do with Rome. Now this is very telling what God did under the Old Testament. Every time he would punish Israel, and it happened often, he would use a nation, a people, or a king. For instance, he used the Philistines, he used the Ammonites, he used all those places around there. Every time God used them to bring punishment and judgment to Israel, he then sent judgment to them. If you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel and the minor prophets, if you read the book of Joshua and if you kind of remember what you've read, you will notice that that is what did occur. The same is going to occur to Rome because God will use Rome to destroy the temple and the city and the nation. And so he will destroy that part of Rome that did it. Now because Jesus said in Revelation 1 verse 1 about the things that are about to happen, whichever translation you read, it's always that. Will quickly happen. Will soon happen. Will happen. They're about upon you. In other words, in their generation. So that means, in my view, that the desolation will be rewarded, if you like to put it that way, on the nation of Rome until that time when the desolation was on Israel, which was AD 70. Because Rome as an empire didn't fall, the Roman city didn't fall for three, four hundred years. And of course a lot of church people like to say that the Holy Roman Empire is an extension of, of uh, some of those kings so forth in the book of Revelation. Well, I certainly don't agree because it was church and state. The Roman Empire itself never had a Christian church. And even if it is the Roman Catholic Church, even if it is the churches all around Germany and and Europe, they were part of the Roman Empire. So they said, it wasn't the Roman Empire. It was the Church Empire. It was the Vatican Empire. It was the Roman Catholic Empire, not the Roman City Empire. So they all have that wrong. I think you would find just about every belief in the end time beliefs is wrong. Because if you get a set of beliefs, you're going to find scriptures that you're going to fit into the, your beliefs. You can't go that way. You have to see the scripture and compare scriptures one after the other. Then you're able to say, this is what really happens. This is what God says. But you see, it's a common thing to get an idea or a spiritual truth and then to form a doctrine. Like we did it with water baptism, we do it with everything. We do it with the baptism of the Spirit, but you see, those things are easy to put together. Salvation, to me, is easy to put together. Justification, sanctification, and all the rest. But it's when you come to try and explain prophecy, that's when everybody goes wrong because they don't look at history. And we didn't know history. You'll never understand these things of the Old Testament unless you know history. Look, I knew that years ago. I used to say to myself, if I only knew the history of the book of Isaiah, I'd understand it better. And I used to say, if I knew the history of all these books, I would understand them. Well, I didn't know the history. And in those days, there were no libraries uh, where you could go to find the books for us. And I didn't know any, pl I didn't know any books to buy. 
But then when I got on the internet, years ago, I discovered history. And uh, the first time I discovered it was when I began looking up the history of, the, of India, because we were going there. Oh, I was appalled. It was a different history of the British in India from what I'd learned at school. So that set me off. I began to look into history and I'm still doing it. So we need to know history. Now I'd like to point this out because there's a great view in churches that Gog and Magog are going to happen again. Now this is interesting about the Assemblies of God. Years ago I studied a course of dispensational truth which I bought from Assemblies of God headquarters Springfield, Missouri, and I got a certificate for it. And in it, they said, end time prophecy is like two ranges. The first fulfillment happened. That's the foremost range. Then there's the same range all over again that has to be fulfilled again. They knew that all the prophecies of the Old Testament had already been fulfilled. They knew. I learnt it. I just believed them though. I just thought, ah, oh, it's all going to happen again. What rubbish. God never said it was going to happen again. Of course it won't happen again. What has happened under the Old Testament will not be repeated. There is an old adage. History never repeats itself. Never. Time goes on, events move, people alter. History never repeats itself. Never. And most people, most of us never learn the histories history lessons, the lessons we should learn from history. Well, because there's such a furor going on about end time in certain quarters, in relation to Gog and Magog, Ezekiel wrote it in chapter 38 and 39 in 597 BC. Now, I have looked up the history and a lot of it in relation to Gog and Magog is somewhat recent. Now, Texmas says it's Kazaria, Ukraine. No, he's wrong. Now a lot of the old scholars said it was the, was the Scythians. So I followed that line because they were famous archers and that's what I used to teach for a little while. Until I discovered, he happens to be a Messianic Jew who's really converted to Christ, who looked into the subject, and we have done this, and he said, the Lydians conquered uh, Gog and Magog. And I have looked at that time, and it happens to be 550 BC, or thereabouts. 27 years after the prophecy, Ezekiel 38 and 39 were fulfilled. Because Gog and Magog, as we learned a long time ago, were one's the king and one's the people, we're in northwest Turkey. If you remember, I had a map and showed it. So we need to understand that there's a lot going on in the, in the churches that is not correct. And also I'd like to point out that as a, it is taught and was taught to me that Daniel 9, 24 to 27 meant a gap. In this case, at least a gap of 2,000 years. Now that's ridiculous. Uh, there is no gap when you really read it, as I explain in my book. But I do know this. For sure, there are no descendants of Abraham to bring to pass anything that happened, already anyway, in the book of Ezekiel or any other book. There's no descendants of Abraham on earth. The covenant is the covenant made by Jesus Christ. Now, turning to the book of Revelation, the first Babylon is Jerusalem. In Revelation 11, you see where he measures the temple. We can turn to Revelation 11. Now, I shall say this. If you want to watch the videos easily, you can uh, show them on your television set. It's a lot easier in my opinion. In Revelation 11, 
he was given a measuring rod to measure the temple in Jerusalem and the altar in Jerusalem. Now the end timers say there's going to be a temple built. Why is he measuring a temple here that didn't exist, that still doesn't exist? There is no temple in Jerusalem. Then he says, do not measure the court outside the temple, for that's given over to the nations, and they will trample the city for three and a half years, 42 months, which is what the Romans did in AD 70 it was. Then you have the two witnesses, which of course we have discovered, are the kings and priests of the Church of Jesus Christ. But, as we've dealt with that more than once, we look at verse 8 and we'll see it happened in the city prophetically called Sodom and Egypt. And you'll find that in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, and where also their Lord was crucified. This is Jerusalem. And then it says, then it mentions in verse 15, at the same time, this is, the kingdom of the world of Israel has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. You'll find that in our teaching on Revelation chapter 11. But when you turn to Revelation chapter 14, it says these words. Revelation 14 verse 8. Then another angel followed, saying, Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great, she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You see, uh, Jerusalem and Israel were supposed to be kings and priests to God. They were supposed to be a testimony to the nations. They never were. Because of her fornication with evil idols and gods, you read it throughout the whole of the Old Testament. How can anybody think Israel was a holy nation when you read that? She was only called holy before God divorced her. God divorced her. It says so. He gave her a bill of a divorcement because there's another bride, the bride of the Church of Jesus Christ. Israel was always evil. Dear me, I used to read some of the things years ago and it was horrible, the, the things they did to each other. Couldn't believe it. But you did. You just took it in your stride because you've heard so many good things about Israel all the time. And uh, here I'd like to point out, if you keep your finger there, that God did not say, he who curses Israel will be cursed and he who blesses her will be blessed. He said it to Abraham. Abraham's not Israel. Jacob's Israel. Abraham's his grandfather. Abraham was given the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham was given the promise of the Messiah to come through his loins. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, he says, Go from your country. I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. The name of Israel was never great, only for periods of time, so that you will bless it, be a blessing. Nation, the nation of Israel was not a blessing when you read the history in the Old Testament. Now, she was a blessing in this regard. By her came the prophets and she was given the law and the promise of the Messiah, as the Apostle Paul said. But then he says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now a lot of people are taken in when they wrongly read those verses. So it's, ba it's Jerusalem who is the Babylon. Because of her fornication with idols, he says in verse 10, 
Now, I'm not doing verse 11 for the simple reason that that relates to the period of the Great Tribulation. I'm talking about what was destined for Israel because of her sin. And Jesus said that because they killed all the prophets, that what should have come on those prophets would come upon their generation. So John says in verse 10, they will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured and mixed into the cup of his anger. And they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So there you have Babylon as Jerusalem because it's the Son of Man as he comes in verse 14 and verse 16 and the wine press of the, of the wine or the blood that was to flow. It was only at the time of the Great Tribulation that Jesus talked about the gospel had, would be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. He wasn't talking about the end of the world. He was talking about at the end of the world of Israel. Have you ever heard of the saying, the world of sport, the world of sin, the world of the church, the world of the earth? Can, uh, uh, applies also to a certain world. And then he says, the hour of his judgment has come. Now this Babylon is being judged. It's not the judgment seat of God that we read about in Revelations 19, 20 and, and, and so on. It's about the judgment of Jesus Christ upon Jerusalem. The judgment of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. So then we have the judgment on Rome. And if you look at Revelation 17, verse 1, it's the great whore. Now Jerusalem is not described as the great whore because Jerusalem and Israel did have some knowledge of God. The whore has no knowledge of God. She's just out and right into whoredom. And it's to do with the kings of the earth, which is the the kings that were associated with the Roman Empire. Verse 5, Her forehead had written on it a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of earth's abominations. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and blood of the witnesses to Jesus. So that's Rome. And a lot of people might say it's the Rome of the Catholic Church. It's, no, that's not. It had to happen in that generation. Now we have done this teaching also in the book of Revelation. But in chapter 18, verse 2, Fallen is fallen, is Babylon the Great. It but has become a dwelling place of demons. And that's similar to what is described about the Babylon of the Old Testament. So there were really three Babylons in the whole of the Bible. The Babylon of the Old Testament of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylon that is Jerusalem, and the Babylon that is Rome. So she falls. The two cities have fallen. And that is the end of Israel. And it is the end of that part of Rome that brought about the final destruction. Now that's just my opinion about this because there were ten Roman empires ten Caesars of the uh, Julian line, starting from the Caesars, Julius Caesars, Augustus Caesar. They founded the empire, there were ten. 
The last one was Nero. And he died in AD 68. And then the reign of Nero was very cruel. I mean, there's this story about Nero, and you probably have heard it, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Nero set the city of Rome on fire in 60, the 60s AD. That is history. They did re rebuild the city later. But this was the first persecution of the Christians that was very widespread. In order to shield himself from the suspicion of firing the city, Nero accused the Christians and made them the victims of his cruelty. Nothing can give us a more vivid idea of his persecution than the account of the Roman historian Tacitus, which is of great interest to us because it contains the first reference found in any pagan author to Christ and his followers. This passage shows the cruelty of Nero and the terrible sufferings of the early Christian martyrs. In order to drown the rumour, Nero shifted the guilt on persons hated for their abominations and known as Christians and punished them with exquisite tortures. Those who confessed their creed were first arrested and then by their information a large number were convicted. So they got out of being killed by telling on the others. Not so much on the charge of burning the city, but as of hating the human race. In their deaths, they were made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with the skins of wild beasts, worried to death by dogs, nailed to crosses, burned to serve for torches in the night. Nero offered his own gardens for this spectacle. And then you have it at the, towards the end of the siege of Jerusalem, the Romans were crucifying Christians, till as we said last time, there was hardly any wood left. So Rome did fall in relation to that part of it, because the, the, the dynasty ceased. After Nero, Vespasian became emperor and his two sons. And then there was the Flavian dynasty, another di dynasty entirely, entirely. So that's the end of that. It was only at the time of the Great Tribulation that Jesus talked about the gospel had, would be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. He wasn't talking about the end of the world. 